My name is Kraft O'Neill, Chairman and CEO of O'Neill Industries. I grew up in the steel business and have had the opportunity to witness the many changes and advances in our industry and company. It's quite impressive how our company has navigated the challenges and opportunities it has faced over its nearly 100-year history. Without the efforts, support, and dedication of our employees, customers, suppliers, and shareholders, our company would not be the success it is today. Some of our roots can be traced back to 1921 when my grandfather, Kirkman O'Neill, founded what would eventually become O'Neill Steel. But our story starts even further back with my great-great-grandfather, Edward O'Neill, and his son, Emmett O'Neill. These men played prominent roles in the development of the state of Alabama as presidents of the State Bar Association, framers of the state constitution, presidential electors, and as father-son governors. Before being elected governor in 1882, Edward O'Neill was a Confederate officer in the Civil War and rose to the rank of Brigadier General. He led regiments and brigades in some of the war's most famous battles, including Chancellorsville and Gettysburg. Edward's son, Emmett, played a key role in the development of the steel industry in Alabama and the South. Many believe his 1911 speech to the Chamber of Commerce of the state of New York was the meeting that made Birmingham. Alabama and the South were still reeling from the blows of Reconstruction and direly needed new capital. U.S. Steel Corporation, only four years earlier, had bought the Tennessee Coal, Iron, and Railroad Company in a move to halt the financial panic that engulfed the country. Now, four years later, money was needed to expand and develop or get out. At the conclusion of Governor Emmett O'Neill's talk, as he sat down, J.P. Morgan, who was seated next to him at the head table, said, You have set your state ahead by 25 years. We're going ahead with our improvements in Birmingham. Morgan spoke for U.S. Steel in those days. His was the final word. The governor set wonderful examples of hard work and perseverance for future generations to follow. My grandfather's life's work was equally impressive. He was among the class of 106 to graduate from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1913. He served as senior lieutenant in the U.S. Navy during World War I from 1917 to 1919 and was on active duty in the North Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean areas. His career began in the shipyards of U.S. Steel and then Ingalls Iron Works, gaining invaluable experience in metal fabrication before deciding to strike out on his own. In 1921, my grandfather saw an ad in the Sunday paper of a little fabrication shop at the west end of Birmingham that was just starting and was looking for additional capital. He borrowed $2,000 to invest in Southern Steelworks, an upstart fabrication business. He later bought out his partners and began to build a business that would become O'Neill Steel. The company thrived, building a strong customer base, and then the Great Depression hit. My grandfather downsized and eked out an existence, deciding to share the profits equally among employees. It would have been easy for him to turn everything over to creditors and start over, but he decided to stick it out. His determination paid off, and as business conditions improved, the company's fortunes did as well. In 1937, Southern Steelworks added a steel distribution division, one of the first in the South. And in 1939, the government began spending money in anticipation of war with Germany, and the economy in O'Neill grew even stronger. By 1940, steel was getting more difficult to obtain due to the prospect of war. Southern Steel received large orders for fabricated steel for buildings at Army and Navy bases and a 16,000-ton dry dock for the Navy. By the time Pearl Harbor was bombed by the Japanese on December 7, 1941, my grandfather had already drawn plans for a new modern plant to be erected on the east side of Birmingham. It would take all America had to offer in manpower and industrial output to hold our own in the two-front war. Thus, my grandfather requested permission to build the plant to furnish war materials to the armed forces and was given top priority to move ahead. Ground was broken on May 2, 1942, and within six months, shipment of 100-pound general-purpose bombs began and the company received orders for superstructures and gun platforms as well. By the time the war ended in August 1945, Southern Steelworks employed over 1,300 men and women, producing not only many types of fabrications for the war effort, but bomb production had grown to over 60,000 per month, double what any other plant in the country was making. For its outstanding excellence in performance of production, the U.S. government awarded the company E Awards in 1943 and 1945. Kirkman's son and my father Emmett, following a duty as Navy lieutenant during World War II, joined the company in 1946. 
The next several decades would encompass significant change and steady growth, including a name change in 1956 to O'Neill Steel and my father becoming president in 1959 and expanding the company throughout the Southeast. The fabrication business was closed in 1969 to focus the company solely on metal distribution. By the 1980s, the company blanketed the Southeast and it was time to expand into other regions of the country. In 1985, just three years before my grandfather's death at age 98, the company made its most important acquisition to date, purchasing Shelby Steel, a strong regional distributor and processor headquartered in Shelbyville, Indiana. With the growth of O'Neill Steel and the addition of Shelby Steel, past leaders, including my grandfather, father, Jack Blackwell, Jim Wall, my brother Emmett O'Neill III, Max DeYoung, Bill Jones, and many others had laid the strong foundation for which our company stands today. My father was a strong believer in growth and said, the future of our company is now and always will be about growth and productive changes. At the same time, we must hold fast to our basic values, like integrity and commitment to excellence that we've had since my father founded this company in 1921. Growth continued into the 90s with the 1997 acquisition of Metal West, headquartered in Denver, being the company's first standalone subsidiary. Acquiring successful companies within the industry with similar cultures, matching values, strong employee and management teams, offering complementary products and services seemed to make perfect sense. Our strategy of profitable growth with diversification and expansion in products, industries, and geography would position us to capitalize on the many opportunities we would be afforded in the coming years, including O'Neill DeMayco, our first business outside the United States, opened in 1998. At the time of my father's unexpected death in 2004, we were closing on Aerodyne Alloys, our first acquisition into high-value nickel, cobalt, and titanium, primarily for the aerospace, medical, and power generation markets. Diversification would continue with the 2005 acquisition of TW Metals, the largest acquisition in our company's history, expanding our geographic reach worldwide followed by the acquisitions of several more global specialty metals companies, including what is now known as United Performance Metals, and extending our global reach even further. Additionally, the acquisition of Supply Dynamics provided us with the unique offering of material aggregation software for OEM customers across industries. This broadening into higher value products sold into new markets, as well as the addition of strong traditional businesses, such as Plate Juggernaut, Leco Steel, has proven to be an effective strategy, reducing volatility in our performance during economic cycles. We've continued to invest heavily in our industrial metals group and in recent years have realigned these companies including formation of O'Neill Manufacturing Services to better service their respective markets. Today, we are a global company providing an extraordinarily high level of quality and service to customers around the world. We offer among the broadest range of products and value-added services in the industry. Most importantly, we do business the right way, with honesty and integrity, and that will never change. There are times when I'm asked about the tree. This particular tree is a tremendous magnolia that had been planted back in 1946 outside of our old offices in Birmingham and the tree was in the way of a new road that was to be built to move our trucks. It had grown and developed with our company throughout the years and when in bloom was a thing of rare beauty. My father wanted to save the tree and move it across the street in front of our new offices. Experts said it couldn't be done, that the tree wouldn't survive. But my father said to move it anyway. It took two 60-ton cranes to lift and move it over 200 feet, roots and all, to its new location. And with care and attention, that tree is still here today, strong as ever. And it is that sense of history, the deep roots and reaching branches that inspire us every day at O'Neill. The sense of what has passed and what is to come in keeping our extended family of co-workers and customers moving forward together. My grandfather had a Latin phrase he liked to use, difficultus nataterum, which means difficulties do not deter us, and they don't. At O'Neill, we are still small enough to treat you like family, but big enough to get the job done.